evening speakers and Good evening, speakers and students. My name is Shailen. As, as mentioned, I am the president of SMS UK. I'm just going to be giving a quick sharing as to what SMS UK is. Um, as you can see on the screen, we are Singapore Medical Society of the United Kingdom. Um, next slide, please. So we were founded in 1994 and we started off with just a few schools in London. Today, we comprise of 26 schools across the UK and have over 1,200 lifetime members. Next slide, please. The purpose of SMS UK is to serve Singapore educated medical and dental students in the UK through career development, education, networking opportunities, as well as social activities. Next slide, please. In terms of career development and education, we strive to provide up-to-date and consolidated information to help our members in their decision making. For example, we have events such as our annual conference, freshers, members and alumni dinner, as well as dental dinner to aim and to provide insight on working not just in the UK, um, but also Singapore. We also recently had our PEG in growth session where members had the opportunity to hear from um, other members who have successfully obtained the grant. This is an event that sees many signups on a yearly basis and is an example of our efforts in helping members achieve their career goals. Our annual conference, as mentioned earlier, is a collaboration with different medical societies such as um, our Hong Kong and Malaysian equivalents and um, showcase what it is like working in these neighboring countries as well as touch on other countries such as the United States. In terms of integrating back to our Singaporean system, SMS UK holds many workshops over the summer, such as our on-call workshop and news, as well as webinars with the Singapore and healthcare clusters as such as today's events. Um, we also organize multiple Asian language classes with a clinical focus, such that our members can be better equipped to communicate effectively and serve a wider range of patients once back home. Next slide, please. SMS UK, of course, also provides networking opportunities, both within the medical student body, as well as with alumni through initiatives such as our mentorship program. We are able to support members from before they get to medical or dental schools with events such as our pre-university talks and up until and even after they qualify as doctors and dentists. Next slide, please. Last but definitely not least, we are also very proud of our social events through fun events from Singapore to the UK and even online because of the pandemic, SMS UK has truly become a home away from home for our members. Next slide, please. So if you have been, if you're Singaporean or have been educated in Singapore, please join us and we can be, find, we can be found on all these social media networks. Thank you. Thank you, Shailen, for sharing. And hi, good, every, good evening, everybody. I'm Ashley, and I'm the president of, the, of SMSI, the Singapore Medical Society of Ireland. So we are a student-run nonprofit organization dedicated towards representing the interests of Singaporeans and PRs pursuing healthcare-related degrees in the Republic of Ireland. So our members are enrolled at five different universities across the Republic of Ireland. They are Trinity College Dublin, University College Dublin and RCSI in Dublin, University College Cork, as well as uh, National University of Ireland Galway. The bulk of our members study medicine and dentistry. However, we also represent members pursuing allied healthcare degrees in physiotherapy, speech and language therapy, occupational therapy, and radiology. Currently, we have 218 active members, as well as more than 300 alumni. Our role is to provide support for our members studying far from home and to disseminate key information such as COVID and employment-related updates. We do this by means of various social, educational, and outreach events held throughout the year. We also keep in touch with our members via Instagram, Facebook, and Telegram channels. The educational events we hold every year include pre-university sharing sessions, such as those that took, that took place earlier this year in February and March. 
We also have events such as Life as a HO, where our alumni, uh, postgraduate year one alumni, will come back to share with our fresh grads about um, Life as a HO in the various healthcare clusters back in Singapore. We also have a PEG sharing session, similar to the one that Shailene mentioned earlier. So this is organized by um, our members who have obtained the PEG grant and it's actually taking place um, next week. We also have tutorials uh, generously taught by Dr. And Dean Tan. Our outreach events allow us to reach out to the wider community and um, serve them. So this includes the SMSI and SPD bake sale, which took place just two weeks ago. We also have a sessions with Willing Hearts and Down Syndrome Association Singapore. Last but not least, our social events allow us to get to know each other and network across the various schools and different years. These include our Chinese New Year dinner, our sports day, the upcoming orientation, and also everybody's favorite annual trip. So that's all about SMSI. You can get in touch with us via our website as well as our Instagram. I'll now pass the time back to Audrey and Tiai. Thank you so much, Shailene and Ashley, for your sharing. We'll now move to a sharing segment by our NUHS resident representatives. Before we begin, we have posted a Slido link on Facebook and on this Zoom chat for you to anonymously ask any questions you might think of throughout the sharing session. Please remember to upload the questions you would like answered. To start off the sharing, we would now like to invite Dr. Pua Kai Lun, a second year resident in internal medicine, to share with us on what we can expect from a life as an NUHS resident. She graduated from University College London in 2016. Dr. Pua, please. Okay, hi everyone. Um, hi, Dr. City. Glad to see you again. Um, um, as I said before, I'm Kai Lun, one of the uh, R2s second year um, internal medicine residence going on on third year and I graduated from UCL in 2016. My uh, journey to residency has been different compared to a lot of other people. Um, a lot of people apply for residency um, probably uh, in the HO year, uh, whereas I took some time out to do some rotations as an MO um, to before I, before I decided for, for internal medicine and applied. Um, I, I think the most important thing um, to realize as an overseas graduate is that the learning curve is quite steep when you first come back. Um, but for all of you who survived the house officer year, um, you probably can survive almost anything. Um, for those who have, of you who haven't decided what you want to do, don't be afraid to take some time out and do uh, what's called the MOPEX rotations where you um, go to different institutions or different um, clusters to do um, whatever you want to do uh, to get some exposure before deciding on it. So that's what I did and I didn't regret it. Um, several of my co HOs are now registrars. Some of them are even my registrars, but um, I felt that this experience actually made me um, stronger and made me um, know for sure what I really, really wanted to do. Oh, uh, sorry. Um, for NUH residency, I was given I was given a choice between SGH as well as NUH internal medicine residency. I had the privilege of doing um, internal medicine postings in both SGH and NUH. I'm not quite sure about time talk saying, um, but what I liked about the NUH uh, residency program was that it was um, there was more exposure to the subspecialties that I did not get when I was in um, in SGH. And I get more time with the seniors. They have time to sit down, teach you, talk you through um, the patients, what you should do, what you should have done. And it makes um, the environment to me was a lot more um, holistic and nurturing um, compared to what, how I felt uh, when I was at uh, SGH. Not to say that SGH is not a good uh, place to be. SGH uh, learns a lot by volume load. So if you're someone who learns by, by volume and learns by doing things a lot of times, SGH is something that you can consider. Uh, for me, I'm someone who needs time to think and um, I try better with um, um, not, say a, not say a less of a patient load, but um, having more time to, to think. So for those who are considering um, NUH internal medicine, 
um, it is a quite a welcoming environment. It is um, the journey is not easy, but um, I think after finishing it, you feel you're where you're supposed to be. Yep, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Paul, for sharing your knowledge and experiences with us. We will now like to invite Dr. Vedena, first year resident in family medicine, to share with us on what one can expect from her life as an NUHS resident. She graduated from University of Glasgow in 2017. Dr. Vedena, please. Hi everyone, uh, very good evening. Um, so yeah, so I graduated uh, from Glasgow in 2017. Um, my journey was quite different because actually after my graduation, I moved down south to Bristol for my F1 and F2 years. Um, so I did both years of my foundation program in the UK because initially at that time, I was still quite open to um, furthering my training in the UK. Um, however, along the way of my training, I decided to come back home mainly for family. Um, so after uh, returning to Singapore, I, I mean, I came back after my F2 in 2019, um, and I started off as an IM uh, MOPEX, so I did MOPEX around in IM, uh, initially in Ng Teng Fong as well as AH. Um, in terms of why NUHS, uh, my husband is an IM resident at NUH as well, so I think I kind of saw how um, it was just a big family and, you know, the kind of friendships he had fostered and all that. I kind of wanted the same for myself as well, um, and in terms of them met, specifically in NUHS, I think um, no doubt it gives the best exposure that one can get to primary care because the kind of postings that we do are definitely very comprehensive and um, it's very unique in the sense that you get an exposure to the private uh, GP sector as well, which is uh, something that's very special to NUHS. Um, as an IMG in NUHS, I think one of the first things that was told to me when I was applying for FEMMED was that, you know, where you graduated from is the last thing that they look at. It's really not an issue. I mean, I know sometimes that when you're studying in the UK, you hear all these rumours that, you know, as an IMG, it's very difficult to further your career in Singapore or that people look down on you or anything like that. Um, but, you know, throughout my two and a half years of working here, I don't think I have ever felt that way um, because of the fact that I graduated locally, I, because of the fact I didn't graduate locally. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, even if you didn't do your HO ship in Singapore, um, you know, I think coming back as an MO, there is still quite a lot of support and uh, learning on the job. And, you know, it's the initial learning curve may be steep, but, you know, this is far from impossible. And I have really enjoyed, you know, working here so far. Um, in terms of why FEMMED, I think, you know, even back in med school, I, I was always quite certain that I wanted to be a GP because I really enjoyed the interaction with patients in the outpatient setting, um, as well as forming that kind of relationship with patients. So to me, you know, FEMMED was always my, my first choice. Um, but I think my advice for people who are currently studying in the UK is that, you know, don't, don't be scared. Um, it's, you know, you, you hear all sorts of things, but really when you come back, it's, it's really quite a big family in NUHS and people are very caring and you know they they really look after you um so so you know if if any of you are planning to come back or planning to do fan med especially in NUHS please feel free to contact me um through any platform I'll be very happy to help because I've been where you guys are at the moment um it can be very daunting but you know it's, it's it'll be fine <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Vandana and Dr. Pa for sharing your knowledge and experiences with us. So we have now come to the end of the sharing segment and it is time for the Q&A session along with Dr. C. So please remember to ask your questions through Slido, which can be accessed through the link in the Zoom chat. If you would like your questions to be directed to either Dr. C, Dr. Vandana or Dr. Pa, please specify when you type out the question. So Dr. C is a head and senior consultant at the Division of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine at the National University Hospital in Singapore. He's also a senior consultant at the National University Cancer, Cancer Institute, as well as an associate professor at the Yonglulin School of Medicine at the National University of Singapore. He's also the program director and leads the research residency program at the NUHS. So he completed advanced specialty training in both respiratory medicine and intensive care medicine in Singapore, and is a fellow at the Royal College of Physicians in Edinburgh and attained his master's in public health at the Harvard School of Public Health. He is competent in bronchoscopy, endobronchial ultrasound, ultrasound guided pleural procedures, as well as thoroscopy. Without further ado, we would like to extend a warm welcome to Associate Designated Institutional Official of NHS Residency. Dr. Xi to join Dr. Pua Kairin and Dr. Vedena for a time of clearly. Dr. Xi, please. 
Uh, hi, <laughs> hey, hi. Uh, uh, thanks uh, everyone for your kind invitation. Um, and also thanks Kailun and uh, Vendana for sharing. I actually wasn't asked to prepare any speech, but uh, perhaps I'll just also um, echo the common view that really for Singaporeans uh, returning from overseas, right? Um, really there is no, um, I don't think you should put yourself under any stress with regards to any perceived and unreal barriers you know, of uh, any form of uh, perception or competency issues because so far in at least our experience, right, all medical students are very, very well trained. I think most times um, when you go for medical school, you're already the cream of the crop among your JC peers, right, among your uh, A-level peers and all of you are all very good. And medical school is just another step, you know, to acquire some skills. Um, I would say that I never had the privilege of going overseas. Uh, mine was a very traditional, chuck you in the local system so you can escape army kind of <laughs> route, right? Um, and of course, then after that, uh, you do your, I, I did my uh, so-called HO ship, MO ship, then went back to army to serve uh, my army so-called uh, NS liability and then came out again. So uh, it was very traditional, but I think I do appreciate that uh, if you go overseas, you actually do have uh, many opportunities to gain a very big worldview. And this uh, huge worldview, right, actually will stand you in good stead uh, wherever you are uh, when you come back to uh, serve the local system. Uh, I think ultimately, if you choose um, a program of training, as Kailun has mentioned, I think I like his approach of moving around a little bit to, to actually get to know what you actually want. Because when you choose a specialty and a place to train, right, you want to answer two questions in particular. The first question is, you know, what would you want to do for the rest of your life? Because <laughs> once you submit to training, right, um, it would be a real waste uh, to drop out halfway because you put in so much effort to get there, right? Uh, you want to complete it and you want to uh, do something you're really passionate about. So don't be afraid to go for what you want, even if it's very competitive. So for example, if you go for a very, very competitive specialty, you know that the chances are not, but not high. Speak to the particular program director uh, of that specialty and, you know, Maybe plan ahead. You know, if you don't make it for the first year, second year, right? Maybe you want to wait for another year and, and try to get yourself well prepared for such a position. I mean, sometimes you may need uh, certain extra things like you know, do a research project or uh, do some other uh, some other thing, some other stuff with uh, some faculty inside to, to you know beef up the, your so-called um uh you know basically advantages like when you go for a selection interview. So, I mean, think of such things. Uh, work uh, early with the uh, specialties that you want. Need not be an exact place where you train, but at least a specialty that you want to uh, gain some uh, additional exposure, gain some additional insight into it. Um, the other thing also is that wherever you want to train in, right, uh, feel free to actually uh, connect early also to know the people there. I think this is really, really important because, um, you know, the people there is really... The, the stuff, right, that would uh, tie you through periods of stress. So I remember during COVID, everyone was working very hard. But whether you're burnt out or not, right, it's not just the amount of work, but whether people you, that you work with, whether they are helpful or not, whether they are kind, you know, whether they are passionate about, uh, you know, patients, whether they will do good. So all these things uh, do factor in. And uh, I, I think you think, number one, about your training, about your future career, but also about the people uh, that you want to uh, work and train with. Because I think ultimately, I think most of the time, you want to you know, train in a place and you feel happy, you want to work in a place. Also. So uh, I think these are some you know, broad considerations that you want to, to have. Yeah, over. Thank you so much, Dr. C. Mm -hmm. um, we have a few questions um, from the Slido. So I'm going to just start reading out the questions. I think this might be directed to Dr. Pua or Dr. Vandana. Um, is it easier to get a job with NUHS after doing F1, F2 in the UK compared to right after graduation? And would you be entering at the same level? Okay, um, perhaps I can take this question since I did F1 and F2 uh, in the UK. Um, in terms of whether it's but it's easier to get in, is it? That, that's the first part, part of the question, is it? Or, so it's very yes, easy. whether it's easier to get a job with okay. um, after graduation. 
Sure. Uh, I don't think it really matters. I think, you know, of course, if you've done your HO ship in Singapore, um, then, you know, it's a different, because you'll be, you have worked with a particular department and let's say that's a department which you're applying to for residency, then, um, of course, I think that would be easier. But I don't think I was in any way advantaged or disadvantaged because I did my F1 and F2 in the UK. Um, but in terms of the question about whether you're entering at the same level, yes, you will be entering at the same level. Um, yeah, I, yeah I, I don't think it really made a huge difference. Um, yeah, I think certain specialties, you know, it does help to get to know the department from an earlier stage. Um, but for FEMMED in particular, you know, it, it really didn't make a difference because, um, you know, most people who are applying for FEMMED would have not worked with that particular department or done a polyclinic testing anyway, so it didn't really make a difference. Thank you very much. Um, our next question is, during application, are we disadvantaged by the fact that we have studied overseas, especially if we are not from one of the more well-known universities? No. And then, uh, yeah, not at all. I mean, we just had our FEMED open house and uh, we, we had people asking the faculty that as well. The faculty is in the ones we're interviewing. And the, the first thing they said was that we really don't look at the medical school that you are from. We just look at how you are as a, as a doctor, how you're functioning as a doctor. So past is in the past. They, they really don't care about which medical school you're from. As you go through your HO year um, or, or MO, rotations for that matter, you will be assessed by, you'll be assigned a supervisor and you'll be assessed uh, based on a very, very objective scale. Um, and then this form will be, will usually be asked for during um, residency applications. And no way on the form does it say um, which university you come to, but it, it will cover things like knowledge, professionalism, patient care. So it's things that they teach you no matter which, um, to which university you go to. So I wouldn't say that you'll be um, disadvantaged from the fact that you're from an overseas university. Um, of course, coming from an overseas university, especially if you're, you come back as an MO, means that you don't, as in you don't spend time with the department, like what Vandana said. Uh, for example, you want to go to urology, most of the time you will need to spend some time with the department, working with the department for them to get to know you, uh, for them to see whether you're suitable fit for their program before joining residency. Um, so it's a lot less about which university you're, for, uh, you're from and more about how well you perform um, as a doctor. I can add to that a little bit. Um, so, I mean, in one of my previous lives, I was also a PD for residence, uh, residency in respiratory medicine. Um, the, the fact is that now when we um, select residents, uh, it's like trying to select a colleague, you know, you know, so uh, I think maybe just one step lower than trying to select a partner in life. <laughs> but you know, a colleague is really a partner. You spend like 50 or more percent of time at work, right? You want to select someone, right, that will not kill the department culture, will not uh, do any harm to our patients, right? And therefore, we want to select good people. Um, I think the advantage uh, of, uh, of, um, of actually having work with a person, let's say, through uh, junior years, uh, it's definitely there, it's definitely there. But certainly, uh, as uh, Vandana has said, right, okay, like for, for some specialties, it's just not possible, especially when you enter at the most junior level. So what do we actually look at? Um, we sometimes look at the, the CV. No, no doubt it's a bit uh, um, crude. Nah, but we're not, we're not looking at the school that you came from. You know? that, that one is irrelevant, seriously. It's irrelevant because all schools that are... Um, approved by the ministry, right, are considered good, are considered good. And we already know your cream of crop, we already know. So what we are looking at are things that maybe you have done uh, outside of school life or even during school life. So for example, if you participated in certain societies, you've done some work, um, you have done some um, uh, service work, you know, for the community. Uh, you know, this reflects a certain character, certain uh, uh, goals, right, which, uh, you know, would actually uh, may, may, you know, actually help you along and help us understand you better. So I think the academic side of things is really quite taken as, you know, you have already done very well. Uh, all of you have passed. We do not doubt anybody's, any medical school's 
ability to judge a competency, but rather when you go for a specialty, we want to know that you're a good person uh, with good goals, good ideals, and that uh, we can actually work with. Uh. So it's actually more like selecting a colleague rather than selecting a, a trainee per se. You know? So that, uh, just a, another perspective that you might want to consider. Yeah, over. Insight. Um, the next question is, what is the application process like for the residency program? So maybe I, I can talk about FEMED in particular. So FEMED um, is, so before your interview, you have to submit uh, your CV, you have to submit your um, basic document about you know, residents that you might have worked with, FEMED residents that you have worked with, as well as FEMED faculty that you might have worked with. Um, then you just submit all your uh, assessment forms, which is what we call C1 forms here, which is basically like during your MOPEC years or your, if you've done your HO year, you know, the supervisor's uh, assessment of you. So you submit all this before your interview. Um, and then uh, it's a panel interview. So for FEMED, it's uh, just one interview for NUHS, um, where the faculty will see, interview you, and then that's it. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit similar for internal medicine. The residency application process is centralized, so it will be a Ministry of Health portal uh, that you you log on and you submit some document. But some of the sponsoring institutions, NUHS, uh, NHG, and Sing Health, they might ask you for um, other specific documents so i had to submit a small personal statement i had to submit letters of recommendation um, on top of the cv and the c1 forms and then they will they will ask you to come down for a chat uh, it's um an informal chat to find out more about you uh, and you know um why you want to do that, that certain residency program i think that if i remember correctly during the the application process they have an equivalent of the SJTs um, in in UK, uh, except it's, it's uh, sort of like an interview kind of thing where you go to four different stations and they give you uh, and they give you a scenario and then they just see how you respond to it. This question is directed to Dr. Zandana. Were there any additional things you did to secure residency with NUHS? Would you advise to come back for housemanship or finish? foundation year in the UK? Um, okay, so, I mean, I didn't do anything in particular. So, so like I said, you know, you have to fill up this form about whether you've worked with any uh, NUHS and med faculty before you, you apply. And actually, I had not worked with anybody from um, NUHS and med. I had only worked in Singapore for one year at that time as an MO in IM when I applied. Uh, however, I did do my, as part of my F2 postings, one of it was actually a GP rotation in a uh, some uh, rural GP in uh, England. So actually during my interview, you know, even though I had never worked in Singapore polyclinic or anything like that, you know, I had a lot to say about the, the kind of um, training that I had in the UK in terms of, you know, working in a GP there. So actually I think they found that quite meaningful because you offer a different perspective um, when you're applying. So I think, you know, that was to my advantage as well. So actually, you know, they are not really um, very particular about, you know, you must have done a polyclinic rotation, you must have worked with people here and things like that. Um, in terms of what I, whether I would recommend coming back for housemanship or finishing housemanship, I think it's, it's quite a personal decision. I mean, the reason I came back um, after my housemanship was because I really enjoyed studying in the UK. I really liked living in the UK and I just wanted to experience working in the UK as well to kind of complete the experience. Um, I didn't really have any rush to come back. There's nobody like asking me to come back or anything like that. So I just wanted to experience living in a different part of the UK as well. And personally, I, I really, really enjoyed my foundation years in the UK. Um, I could go back in time, I would still choose to do my F1 and F2 in the UK. Um, I mean, like I said, initially I was quite open to working in the UK long term as well. So that's the reason why I did both years there. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would I would recommend actually at least doing your F1 in the UK because, you know, you go to med school in the UK, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a very different experience working there. And I think it's, it's quite... You know, it's just a life experience, isn't it? Like going to a different city and working in a different hospital. All that is just a life experience. There's no rush to, you know, come back and I like, again to residency. No, like, no such thing. So I, I don't know. I personally, I would highly recommend if you have the opportunity to work in the UK. Um,
The next question is asking about selecting students for residency program and prestige of university, but I think we have um, addressed that. Uh, this question is directed to Dr. C. Just wondering if there's a right time to pursue masters such as public health or global health while training in residency or no tech. Okay, so uh, I, I think uh, for this question, right, there's an underlying assumption <laughs> that uh, you, you have time to kind of uh, juggle both residency and other things, right? Um, personally, I, I, I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure because uh, let's say uh, from what I see, right, residency in general is hard work, it's hard work. I, I cannot, you cannot escape that. Um, the hours are long <laughs> and, uh, you know, <laughs> As, as you know, there's this favorite uh, two, two word thing, duty hours, you know, that you know, everybody gets killed by. So hours are very long. Uh, you will come in early for work, you will leave late. Um, uh, and uh, I, I would also urge everybody to look at work-life integration because, um, you know, you have life outside of medicine, you know. You have to take care of your family members, you go and find a partner, have babies, whatever, you know. You, you need time for that kind of thing. So I think... Um, Apart from work, you know, your, your clinical work, you add on research, add on education, teaching, right? Add on family, right? Uh, how much uh, bandwidth you have uh, um, is anybody's guess, of course. But I, I will urge that give yourself some room you know, to wiggle. And because you need this wiggle room, right? Uh, it might not be so great nah, to actually try to pile on another master's on top of it. Because master's, as um, you would uh, kind of set, um, think through, right? it's actually a bit more difficult than the bachelor's. Uh, and of course, it's a lot more intensive also. And therefore, to do well in both, right, may be a stretch for a lot of people. Like. So, so think through this, give yourself band, some bandwidth, uh, give yourself some uh, ability to have proper work-life integration. Yeah, over. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is directed to Dr. Kailun. Was there any reason you chose to come back to Singapore instead of training in the UK? Um. The reason I came back to Singapore is similar to a lot of my uh, colleagues. It's mainly for family. Um, but I was quite close to staying in the UK, at least for F1 year. Um, the reason I chose to, came, to come back is because I felt that the, number one, that, the, that going through HO year in, in Singapore would allow me to get used to the system with not that much responsibility compared to coming back as an MO. Um, and the second reason was that in if you do F1, you have to move, right? You move house if you change hospitals. So that was quite a put off for me as well. Thank you. Um, then there's a quite there's a question asking, are NUS medical students mostly favored over overseas grads? So maybe uh, I'll take it up as a general rule. So the, the answer is uh, no, no. Uh, basically, all medical students and all medical schools are well regarded. Uh, and in Singapore, you know, there's just more than NUS as well. There's LKC, there's uh, Duke NUS. So um, I, I think there's no favoritism uh, based on a medical school. It's just really based on who you are, what you have done, and you know how, how good you'll be in terms of gelling with the rest of the team. Yeah, over. Do internships and placements during med school matter or just the jobs after graduation? Uh, I'm going to assume that this is regards to electives um, as a, in, in medical school. No, I don't think it matters very much. I came back to do my elective in final year in Singapore. Um, I did it to get used, to try to learn a little bit more about the, the system, um, but it didn't really uh, impact uh, residency. Um, like what we mentioned earlier, it's a lot of it is how you perform as a doctor and how you get along well with the re uh, respective departments that you're applying to. Yeah, I completely agree. I don't think it's uh, any bearing on getting into residency. Um, so I had two electives for, for my medical school and I actually did one of it overseas in India. Um, and then the other one, I came back to Singapore. So I, I don't think coming back to Singapore made a difference or going overseas on my other one made a difference. So uh, yeah, I think, you know, just do what, what you think will get you the best experience. Just to add on to that, if you are very dead set on doing a certain specialty, 
um, coming back for electives in that rotation and then making yourself known to the department, telling the seniors there uh, that you're interested in doing a residency program with them and asking them about things like research. It can, it can help, but in general, most, most people go through residency, uh, get into residency without any, um, without their electives having any bearing on their um, uh, acceptance rate. Thank you. Our next question is directed to Dr. C. Uh, what's the acceptance rate for residency applicants? So I, I guess uh, for residency as in for the whole of Singapore, if, if I guess overall acceptance rates will be quite high. Most people are so-called matched. Uh, that means uh, when you choose a specialty, uh, I think most people do get uh, matched. Uh, some of course, would be a bit more difficult some parts of residency, especially for the more competitive programs. I mean, you, you know those. Uh, uh, usually, uh, uh, those programs are well known. So for those, I think do expect that the acceptance rate at the, at the first pass may be a bit lower. Um, but what I've seen is that uh, if people are passionate enough, right, they go for it the second time or third time, or at least have some form of understanding with the program directors that uh, they may uh, you know, go in after about two to three years. So I think ultimately, uh, underlying this question is um, uh, probably some form of a vision making, right? To select those programs that have a better acceptance rate. Um, I guess it, it can be done if you have kind of equal interest among a few programs, but I don't think you should actually go into a program just because acceptance rates are, are, are high for that year. Because ultimately, you know, that's your, your life, you know, you have to work in a specialty for life. So better make sure you work in somewhere where you're in a happy place. Over. Thank you. Our next question is, would local medical students have an advantage in the sense that they are able to make connections with relevant departments earlier during their school years? I don't think so. Now in this age, even if you're overseas, you can make, uh, you can make contact with the departments or the, the seniors that you'd like to work with, um, and you can arrange for for electives. And it's only a handful of of um, people that I know that um, got in touch really really early, like fourth year or third year, and then I started doing research with them that um, really helped um, the, the, respective, the respective departments get to know them better. But in general, I don't think that's a rule. Thank you. Next question is directed to Dr. Vandana. Um, where did you do your election? <laughs> I did it at CMC Bangalore. Actually, NUS has, has a kind of partnership with them as well. So it's a very popular place that a lot of people go to. Um, that's highly recommend. It's very fun. Um, this, this question is directed to Dr. C. Do those who do not match for residency become a GP? Mm, okay, so this, um, for those who don't match for residency, then. That, okay, I, I guess it means that for those uh, folks, right, who do not enter a residency training program, right, okay, um, for Singapore now, right, for family uh, medicine, I think it's better to go through residency still in family medicine because as when they don't know, the training is, is quite comprehensive. You know? And ultimately, uh, you want to go a bit further to get your master's in family medicine and get, uh, okay, when they know, probably better than I that there are higher degrees to go for. So family medicine in itself is a specialty. Um, so for folks who do not want to go to family medicine, yes, you can join a, a general practitioner group, but I think um, you must be happy to work at a probably a, a fairly uh, basic level without uh, additional training. Um, but there are, I mean, there are other avenues outside of a residency system, of course, uh, for doctors to work in. In, even in clinical practice. So there are now uh, new systems uh, such as uh, medical officer schemes are going on to residency physician, medical officer schemes going on to something called a hospital clinician. So you can be a hospitalist, you can work in acute medicine, subacute medicine with other forms of training. Um, of course, uh, you can totally not work in clinical medicine altogether and get into uh, other things like, you know, 
pharmaceuticals and uh, uh, business and stuff like that. Um, so I think overall, uh, residency is probably the major route for training. It's the most structured. And that's where the country has invested a lot into. the. And I think if you really want to get the best out of your uh, postgraduate education, right? I, I still think it's better to do residency you know, because that's where all the uh, processes and structures have been uh, developed quite rapidly over the last few years. And, and I think it's fairly robust at this time. Yeah, over. Thank you. Um, we have a question. What is the pathway like for family medicine and internal medicine? Um, so pathway as in, yeah. if they mean by the residency, so it's a three-year residency program for family medicine, and then subsequently we do an MMED in FEMMED, um, and then you sign on as a, usually you can either go to a community hospital after that, or you can, what most people do is sign on with a polyclinic, um, so they start off as a registrar in a polyclinic, and then subsequently you can do a fellowship in family medicine, and then you can become a kind of consultant in uh, family medicine. So that's a government, I mean, that's a public health pathway. Um, of course, you always have the option after your MMED to join a private GP uh, chain as well if you want to. For internal medicine, you do three years of junior residency, then you choose to subspecialize. Um, so it can be, it can range anywhere, anywhere from two years as an advanced internal medicine trainee or wait to three and a half years for cardiology and dermatology. Thank you. Um, we, I think we only have time for one last question. Um, I see a question here. How do we contact Singapore doctors for research opportunities? Do you have any tips? Yeah, okay. So I, I think contacting is really the easy part, you know, because uh, nowadays there's uh, internet, right? You search for anybody, you know, you get the, um, you don't need to go on a dark web to find people, uh, basically. It's very easy, right? Just go Google, look at the papers, and you'll find the, the, the folks that have written those papers and who are interested in research. I, I think the more difficult part is deciding what you can do uh, after that, you know, after you contact, because... Um, Ultimately, you will spend a lot of time overseas. And uh, what sort of research would be consistent with those uh, schedules, whereby you need to have some form of synchronicity. Uh, you need to uh, be able to do some work uh, uh, without coming back to Singapore. Uh, so think, think about it. You know, what sort of work and what sort of ideas you want to bring to the table? Uh, and, then, and then contact someone about it. Because uh, I think that would align yourself better to what you can contribute to a research project. Yeah, I mean, one example of a simple one or rather simple design is that you, you do some form of review, right? Write some of paper. So um, for those, uh, yes, I think you can do it from overseas, uh, but others, uh, other kinds of research designs, you might want to uh, think through a little bit more before you, you make the jump in contacting. Yeah, over. Okay, um, thank you so much for patiently answering all our questions, Dr. C, Dr. Pua, and Dr. Vanadal. So unfortunately, our speakers will be taking their leave now, but if anyone would like to ask them any further questions, we have included a link in the Zoom chat to get into contact with our speakers, which will be available for a week from today. So before they leave, could we take a quick screenshot? So may everyone turn on their video cameras if you wish. Okay, I think Sammy will be taking a screenshot. So, okay. three, two, one. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you once again, um, Dr. C, Dr. Pa, and Dr. Vanada. So, um, we've come to the end of our NHS, SMS UK, and SMSI student interaction session for 2022. Okay, thank you. All the best. Thank you. And uh, yeah, really feel free to contact us if you need any help. Thank you everyone for taking time off to join us in today's event and thank you to our speakers today. We also really appreciate
Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> we also really appreciate it if you could fill out the respective participant feedback form shown here. We hope this session has been informative, engaging, and we look and we look forward to seeing all of you again in the future. Feel free to leave the call, everyone. Thank you.